I will move to the next presentation, that is Professor Sean Van Elden. Uh, he is uh, doing similar research, but in Australia, which is interesting. We can see how things correlate. Um, Professor Sean is, uh, grew in uh, South Africa and completed his honors in marine science at Nelson Mandela University. He moved to Australia and joined the Marine uh, Futures Lab in 2017 to undertake, to undertake his PhD. The focus of Sean PhD's uh, thesis uh, was to was the ecology of offshore oil and gas platforms, and he has continued his this research in his position as a research fellow at the University of Western Australia since 2021. Sean has seven years of experience in the field of offshore platform ecology, and is currently leading a multi year ecological survey of an offshore platform on Austra Australia's northwest shelf. Thank you for, for joining us, uh, uh, Professor Sean. Please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes, 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 yes. yes. OK, so. This research started in 2017, where we were actually approached by an oil and gas company, Vermilion, um, to do surveys around one of their platforms in Australia. And something I think Professor Roberts touched on in his presentation was about perception. And that's the reason they came to a university to have this work done, so that they weren't controlling the research and it had this perception of being independent and obviously going through the peer review process, rather than them doing the research themselves. So for my presentation, I'm really going to focus on our scientific approach in terms of the ecology and this novel ecosystems approach that we used, and then our methods, which is baited cameras. So this image you can see of the tiger shark here is from the Wandu platform, and that's a tiger shark on one of our baited cameras there. So just to give you an idea first of the area where we're working, this is tropical northwestern Australia. It's a very remote, low population area, uh, but oil and gas has been around there for a long time. So about 60 years since exploration started in that area. And actually the first surveys of fish in this area were done by oil and gas companies. So we didn't really have a baseline there of what fish were like before the oil and gas industry started there. So there are around 60 platforms in place at the moment and thousands of kilometers of pipeline connecting these platforms, some of them to each other and some of them to the shore as well. And crucially, this area is also a biodiversity hotspot. So there are around 250 species of sponges in this area. Um, and that's after a lot of trawling as well and hotspots for certain shark species as well. And it's a key route in the whale migration, which actually goes through this area where all these oil and gas leases are. The humpback whales calf up in the north and then move back down through this area. So this is the, the field that we're working on. We've been working there, as I said, since 2017, and we've got this project going on until 2027. So we'll have a 10-year time series of ecological data by the end of it. This platform has been in place for about 30 years now. We've got a smaller unmanned structure, this Wandu A on the left, which is a steel monopod. And then the major structure in the field is Wandu B, which is a concrete gravity structure. And it's over 100 meters long, this base structure by 70 meters wide. So this is a massive structure in an area with very little hard substrate. It's generally quite a sandy bottom, very few natural reefs in this area. Now, the approach that we decided to use for this project was a novel ecosystems approach. So I was quite fortunate to have Richard Hobbs on the team for my PhD, who's a restoration ecologist. He focuses on terrestrial ecosystems. And in some ways, decommissioning is a restoration ecology problem. So it's the same as the approach towards mining or rehabilitating farmland in that it's humans have altered an ecosystem. And what do we do? if anything, to return that ecosystem to the way it was before. 
So Richard Hobbs came up with a novel ecosystem concept, and this is really focused on ecosystems where humans have changed the state of the ecosystem through their activity on the land or in the ocean. And for multiple reasons, we don't want to return that ecosystem back to the way it was before. Now, in some cases, this could be because there's ecological value that's arisen in this ecosystem that we don't want to lose. But in some cases, it's just not possible to restore an ecosystem to the way it was originally to its pristine, untouched state. So these are just a couple of examples of this concept. The first one is the Mount Sutro Cloud Forest in San Francisco, which is has a lot of invasive eucalypt trees, which are actually Australian, but it's created this really socially important public place that is now being maintained as this forest, despite having invasive species. And then the second example here is farmland in southwestern Australia, where I'm based, where the soil conditions have changed through decades of farming. And we have these novel assemblages of plant species now because of that. So you would have to change the soil chemistry if you wanted to return that ecosystem to how it was before. Now, this is a concept that was really, for the most part, restricted to terrestrial environments. And apart from a couple of studies on bleached coral reefs, for example, but we decided to look at oil and gas platforms under this concept of novel ecosystems. So to start with, what we did is we looked at oil platforms just broadly from the literature. What do previous ecological studies tell us about oil and gas platforms as novel ecosystems? And what we did is we took the criteria for novel ecosystems and we broke them down into separate points that we could then use the literature to look for evidence to support or refute these points, these criteria around oil and gas ecosystems. So firstly, we looked at whether the environment has been altered from his, its historical state by human activity. We found quite a bit of evidence for this. Obviously, you're introducing this large structure, hard substrate into the marine environment, and that's gonna have an impact on the marine communities. So this is an example from Alan Friedlander that was done in Gabon, where they found much higher biodiversity on oil platforms than they were finding in the surrounding environment. And they were finding that the platforms were actually stepping stones for these Atlantic species moving across from the Caribbean that weren't actually found in these West African regions before because the habitat wasn't suitable for them. The second criterion we looked at was essentially around novel qualities. So is there something of this ecosystem that is novel, that wasn't there before and should be kept? So this is an example of that from Qatari waters, where whale sharks are now aggregating around offshore platforms because of upwellings and better feeding opportunity than they would have had before the platforms were in place. And we see various examples of megafauna aggregating around platforms around the world. And then that last criterion is it can't be returned to its historical state due to practical limitations. So the example I have here is a, it's really a social example of why we wouldn't want to get rid of these platforms in that they have high value in terms of diving and fishing. But in some cases, the platform is simply too big to safely be removed. And that's a limitation on returning it to its historical state as well. So the next step was to take this novel existence concept and use it as a case study, because we can't say every single offshore platform is going to be a novel ecosystem. It really depends on the local conditions, the environment that it's in, how long it's been there for. So we use that one do platform from Vermillion as a case study for this work. And the key to this was really based on our focal method, which is BRUVS, Baited Remote Underwater Video Systems. So this allows us to sample a large area in quite a cost-effective manner. It's a non-destructive sampling method. So instead of doing a trawl and going and catching the fish to see what's there, we can actually count them while they're still alive. And as I mentioned, we can deploy them over large areas. So in a two-week period, we can cover 50 kilometers deploying grubs at certain intervals. And what this gives us is really a snapshot in time. So these are deployed for one or two hours at a time. And it gives us an idea of what the marine communities look like at this place at that time. And that applies to long-term monitoring. So we can come back to this place in the next season, in the next year, 
and have ongoing surveys to see the changes in these communities over time. The nice thing about these brugs as well is they can de be deployed on virtually any size vessel. So this is from a small zodiac on one of the National Geographic expeditions. But this example here on the left is from a 22 meter research vessel that I was using for my work. And we were deploying about 100 of these brugs in a day on some on really good days, depending on the tides. But we can get a lot of data in a short amount of time with this method. So what brugs consist of is if you look at the image on the right, you can see that horizontal bar has two GoPro cameras. And this allows us to get stereo measurements, which is really important. I'll talk about that in a bit. But these are angled in towards a container at the end where the shark is that has bait in it. So that's what attracts these animals in towards the brugs and allows us to identify and to count them. We have seabed brugs, which have been around for quite a while. These are just dropped down with a surface float onto the seabed and they're set there for an hour and we count all the fish that are generally already there, demersal species and those that are attracted to the bait. Midwater species, pelagic species take a little bit longer because they're more sparsely distributed. So we leave these in place for two hours to count the pelagic species. So this is what we get out of the Brugs data. We identify the species to the lowest possible taxonomic level. So depending on how far it is from the camera, how fast it's swing by, generally we can get them down to species level. We count them using max n, which is the maximum number of individuals within a frame of the video. So this example you can see here with the golden trevally swimming around, we would pause the video at the point where we have the most individuals in the frame and count them at that point, because obviously we can't count the whole school when they're just circling around the camera all the time. And then having that stereo video allows us to measure the animals as well, which not only allows us to calculate the biomass of animals in a location, but it also allows us to determine whether they're adults or juveniles. So over the course of my work, uh, this is that same vessel with the seabed brugs and one do platform in the background. But over the course of six expeditions, we deployed over a thousand of these brugs, both seabed and midwater brugs. We collected 1,700 hours of video footage, and that was in about seven weeks of field time spread over three years. So we can really get a lot in a short amount of time in this method. We counted over 35,000 individual animals across these surveys from 358 different taxa. And this ranges from jellyfish and starfish all the way up to whales. Now, a key point of this work is that we weren't looking at this, the communities on the platform structure itself. With a method such as Brobes, you can't actually deploy right on top of the infrastructure. There's a risk of the equipment getting tangled with the infrastructure, for example. So we everything we did was 50 meters away from structures. And this really meant that we were sampling that ecological halo. So natural and artificial reefs have this halo effect where abundance and diversity of fish is higher around them and then drops off slowly as you move away from that structure. A key part of this research in terms of that novel ecosystems concept was seeing how Wandu might have changed from its historical state. And for that, we needed to have an idea of what that environment, what the substrate would have looked like before the oil platforms were installed. So we could have Obviously, we can't go back in time to do this research, but we could have almost a proxy for what it would have looked like at that time. So this is just off the Dampier of Borough Peninsula in northwest Western Australia, about 70 kilometers offshore is the Wandu platform. And then to the right of that, we had a sandy site, which from the data we had from Vermilion is as close as possible to what it would have looked like beforehand. So we deployed brugs there as well, and then at a natural reef, which is about the same size as the footprint of the Wandu infrastructure to have a natural versus artificial reef comparison. And going back to those novel ecosystems criteria, this is what we found from our Brove surveys at these sites. First thing we looked at was habitat. So the Northwest Shelf, this area where we were working, used to be covered in sponges and soft corals before heavy trawling took place in the 1970s and 1980s. But what we found is that there was still quite a bit of uh, macrobenthos or sponge and soft coral habitat around the Wandu infrastructure and much more than we were seeing at the other two sites. And this we think is because Wandu has been protected from trawling for the last 30 years. 
because in Australia, infrastructure is protected by a 500 meter petroleum safety zone, and there's no fishing allowed within that zone. So that means that this ecosystem and that ecological halo has really had time to recover from that historical trawling in that area. Obviously, around a natural reef, there's only so much trawling they can do without potential damage to the equipment. So there was still some macrobenthos there, but not nearly as much as that one do. And at the sandy site, what one do would have looked like before, there was almost no macrobenthos cover anywhere that we looked there. So from this, we could say, going back to those novel ecosystems criteria, that Wandu had been altered from its historical state. This, I hope you can see this on the screen there, but this was looking at the demersal fish assemblages and how they varied in terms of their key species or the species characterizing the assemblages between the sites. And essentially what this is trying to show is that on the left hand side, the green and the dark blue, you have Wandu and the natural reef, and it's dominated by reef associated species. Whereas the sandy site, what Wandu would have looked like before, is dominated by lizard fish, which is a low value fish that kind of takes over when most of your diversity has been wiped out, really aggressive, and they eat a lot of other fish as well. So that they're known to reduce diversity as well. But this was a novel quality. So Wandu has a different assemblage from what would have existed beforehand. And just quickly looking at the research in terms of that ecological value, richness and abundance of demersal species were also much higher at Wandu than they would have been previously. And they much more resemble what we find at a natural reef in the area. Now, the reason for this, as I mentioned briefly, was that historical trawling in the area. So this area was trawled really heavily. They estimated that the trawls were taking about 80 kilograms of sponges and soft corals per half hour. That's for one vessel at that time. And crucially, what we saw from the trawling data, this is just from the catch data at the time, is a shift from those reef associated species, the emperors and the snappers towards lizard fish. So the reason the fishery stopped in that area is they actually weren't catching their target fish, those emperors and snappers anymore, and they were predominantly catching lizard fish after that time. So what we're seeing with Wandu then in that case is that the catch composition shifted from these emperors and snappers to lizard fish, but Wandu we're seeing more of the emperors and snappers, which we think means that it's returning to what it was before the trolling took place. Obviously, we don't have data from that time. There were no surveys done before the trawling started. But this gives us an idea that there's high diversity and probably a window into what this whole Northwest Shelf would have looked like in the past before trawling occurred there. So in terms of what we found from this work, which, as I said, is still going on, is that this term of novel ecosystems can be applied broadly to offshore oil and gas platforms but it really does need to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. There's a lot that can be taken into account, but this is a good starting point to, to use a well-recognized restoration ecology principle to assess the value of these platforms. We found that the Wandu structure as our case study did meet the criteria as a novel ecosystem, at least in terms of the, the fish communities found there. And going back to that trawling, it's really acting as a marine protected area. And this is something that's been found in West Africa and other regions as well, is that oil and gas platforms, where there's a protection zone around them that doesn't allow fishing, they act as marine protected areas. They have higher diversity and they allow the habitat to recover as well. And then finally, stereobrobes haven't really been used to study platforms in the past. They've been used a bit on pipelines, but this is really an effective method for covering a large area at one time it's relatively low cost in terms of vessel time as well. And this gives us data that we can compare with broad surveys that have been conducted in other habitats around the world. And then just in terms of what this means for decommissioning, obviously this was a company that had approached us to do this work and wanted our recommendations based on the fish communities there. It would really be beneficial for the entire structure to be retained. We've done other work from ROV surveys, their industry ROV surveys that found that midwater portion of the structure. So the shafts of that concrete gravity structure are really important for juvenile fish and aggregations of these trevally as well. 
But crucially, that protection from fishing, if it is left in situ after, de after decommissioning, would be really important. Dampier is quite a big fishing area, low population, but quite a high percentage of people have boats up there. So they all know where the platforms are and are already talking about what's going to happen when these are decommissioned and they can finally fish around them. So some sort of protection around them would be really important because otherwise these communities are just not going to survive. Thank you. So thank you to our partners Vermillion um, and Jetwave Marine who provided the vessel for this work.